Well, good morning. Good morning. Please sit down. Don't stand on my account. We're so glad that you are in church today, whether you are sitting in the building or watching online. Welcome. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to be in church. And I think that says something about you. And uh, as was said, I believe God's word is living, is breathing, is active. And uh, one word from God can change the very course and the very trajectory of your life. So we're going to open God's word together this morning. Did you bring a Bible? If you did, please pull it out with me and find the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis, the 12th chapter. And if you're new to the scriptures, uh, find the table of contents, turn a page to the right, and you will be in the book of Genesis and uh, find Genesis 12 and then mark your place and find the book of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament toward the back and find chapter 11. And we'll get there in just a moment. But what an incredible honor and privilege to be here before you today to read God's word with you this morning. And uh, I realize that without invitation, I've got no business speaking into what I had no part in building. So I just want to let you know I'm so grateful to your pastors, to your leaders, Pastor Brian and Bobby Houston, and your amazing church um, for giving me the opportunity. And I want to say thank you uh, for leaving an impact on my life. Your church, I don't know if you know this, but you're having influence around the world. And uh, perhaps sometimes you just need an outside perspective to remind you of how good you really have it. And I'm glad that I get to be a part of a local church that gets to be on mission with you. You know, we're part of the great commission, co-mission, the local church on mission together to be the hands and the feet of Jesus around the world. So come on, church. We can do this together. We can reach the world for Jesus. And, um, as was introduced, my name is Harrison. Uh, people call me H, and I'm good if you want to call me that. And uh, My wife and I lead an amazing church in Southern California where Jesus lives. Um, the church is called Cottonwood Church, and I bring greetings from the United States, from the land of the free and the home of the brave. And, uh, and uh, my wife, I, I talked to her on the phone last night, and she wanted to make sure that I sent her love to you. And uh, she's given me three beautiful little boys. Uh, can I show you a picture of my family? Is that all right? Uh, so we can all get to know each other a little bit. Go ahead and throw that first picture up on the screen. Uh, as you can see there on the right is my beautiful wife, my better half tomorrow. We will be married 13 years. Uh, her name is Bethany Brooke, and uh, she has given me three beautiful little boys. And I say given because. I had the fun part, and she did all the rest of the work. And um, uh, some of you are just understanding that now. But and, um, she's giving me these three little boys. We got a close up of the boys. Can you throw the next one up? There they are, uh, my little nuggets uh, on the far right. Uh, that's Asher, and uh, he's going to be 10 years old in a week. On the far left, uh, that's Sawyer Cash. And uh, I wanted to just name him Cash because how awesome of a name is Cash, right? But my wife said we have Asher, who we call Ash. You can't have Ash and Cash. And, I said, you don't know. So we just named him Sawyer Cash. And in naming him Sawyer, we didn't know it, but apparently we reincarnated Tom Sawyer. And it's a fight every day to get his shirt on and his shoes on. But um, that Sawyer Cash, he needs Jesus. So if you think about it, pray for us. And then in the middle, uh, that's little Clay Harrison, uh, my little namesake. And he's two and a half years old. And life is full and life is loud. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Can we jump in the Word of God this morning? So when I want to speak to you from the subject and from the topic of how do I discover, how do I decipher, how do I walk in God's will for my life? And perhaps I want to speak to a specific group of people in here, those that have at different junctions, different moments in life felt stuck, felt afraid to take a step or afraid to move forward because what if I'm not in God's will? And contrary to popular opinion, I actually don't believe uh, God's will is as mysterious, as mystical, or as complicated as we've come to believe it to be. Uh, quite the opposite. I actually believe that God wants us to know and to walk out his will. Paul prayed uh, to the Colossians. He said, I pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. God's will was never meant to be a source of confusion or consternation in our world, a, a place that kept us operating in anxiety and or fear where we felt stuck, afraid to take a step. So this morning, I want to give us some practical thoughts around how do I discover God's will for my life. But before we dive in, could we pray? Because the truth is, if the Holy Spirit doesn't get involved with this message, it's just words of human wisdom, and that, that could be helpful. But at the end of the day, I don't want just help. I, I want change, and I want transformation, and that's what the Holy Spirit can do. So let's pray together. Father, we love you, and we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, and we thank you for your word. We pray as the psalmist prayed, oh God, revive us according to to your word, your word that you've exalted even above your name. And as we dive in, we pray that you would bring illumination. May it be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Holy Spirit, we ask that above all things, you would illuminate Jesus, that Jesus would be like that diamond, that no matter what angle we look at him from, 
we get a new glimpse of his brilliance, of his kindness, his goodness, and his grace. Jesus, may you be exalted today. May you get all of the glory. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 As it comes to discovering God's will, let me perhaps paint a picture for you. When I was eight years old, my parents enrolled me in these classes called kidnastics. And it is exactly as it sounds. It is kids doing gymnastics. And as an eight-year-old boy, um, kidnastics was the epitome of humiliation. Um, not, not because gymnastics is any less of a sport, but because at eight years old, I just was not the, the picture of athletic prowess that is standing before you this morning. And, and, and someone asked me recently, Harrison, have you ever held a grudge? And I said, yes, for the last 26 years of my life, because my parents put me in kidnastics. Now, you have to understand this about me. I know we've just met, but I'm an incredibly competitive person individual. And if I don't feel like I'm performing well at a certain event or anything in particular in life, I don't tend to enjoy myself. And as I engaged in uh, kidnastics, the first event that they tried me out in was called the pole climb. It's about a 10 meter pole and you're supposed to scamper up the pole and kind of hit the symbol at the top and slide down, tag your partner, right? They go up and they time you. No one ever wanted to be my partner in the pole climb. Because the truth is, if they were my partner, they would never get a chance to go because I would never make it all the way to the top of the pole. So, so the coach said, okay, this is not for you. Let's try you on the uneven bars. Do you know what the uneven bars are? They should be called the instant death bars, right? Like you've got this separate set of bars. One is higher than the other, and you're meant to hold on to it and swing and get momentum and then let go, right? Like leap of faith, grab onto the net. That, that was not for me. So what they did, they decided to put me up on the balance beam. Now, I won't say I was great at the balance beam, but I was fairly proficient. And I think the reason I was proficient was because it was the only event I wasn't afraid of, right? Because if you fall, you're falling two feet onto padded floor. I'm like, I can deal with this. And they taught me a, a 15 second routine where you would do all sorts of spins and turns and things, which I'm not going to show you today because I left my Lycra at home. And <clears throat> But that was my life. I was there in kidnastics, and one day they decided to have a little kidnastic Olympics where they broke us into groups, and in our groups we each had our separate events, and mine, of course, was the balance beam. And I remember learning this 15-second routine. I get up. It's, it's my turn, and the coach says, go. And as soon as he said go, it was sort of one of those moments where the world sort of stops spinning, right? Where everything kind of closes in around you. And I, I went to that sort of dark blank space in my mind, and, and I found myself up there on the balance beam. This narrow platform just got smaller and smaller and more narrow, and, and I was there frozen. I was so afraid in that moment to, to fail. I was so afraid to take a step in, in either direction because I, I didn't want to let down my team because this is back in the day before you got a trophy for finishing in last place. There were no participation awards, and that's a message for a different day. But I didn't want to let down my team, and, you know, and I, I didn't want to embarrass myself by falling in front of everyone. I didn't want to let down my coach that had worked hard with me to, to develop this routine. And in that moment, there I was, stuck and completely frozen, unable to take a step. And I know that some of you are in here, and you're like, man, what is he talking about? Where's Jesus and all this? Listen. Um, the reason I, I bring that up, that picture of the balance beam up, is because when it comes to God's will, I feel like a lot of Christians see God's will like a balance beam act, like this, this tightrope walk where they're so afraid to take a step. They're so afraid to make a decision about their future because what if they fail? What if they get it wrong? What, 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 what if they embarrass their family and they want their life to count and, and they don't want to mess it up? What if I let God down and people are stuck on the balance beam of life as it pertains to God's will. That's not God's intention for you. When I was a kid, there was a term that got thrown out in the church world quite a bit. Maybe you've heard it. The, the perfect will of God. That term terrified me because it insinuated that there was only one proper path. And it was sort of this knife edge that you were balancing back and forth on. And there was only one proper step and one proper direction. And it, was it door one or was it door two? Because it certainly couldn't be both. And I lived in this constant fear of, I better make the right choice. And on top of that, people would say to me, Harrison, one day you're going to have to stand before God and give an account of your life, all the things you did, all the things you didn't do. And I'm like, I know. And it's terrifying. Because from a pure heart, I honestly wanted to follow God, and I wanted to be in his perfect will for my life. I didn't want to mess it up, but for years, through my formative years, high school, into university years, I lived under this constant pressure, this constant fear of, I better get this right. 
As I look back on it, I realize I lived from this particular school of thought that kind of said, God, I'm not going to move and I'm not going to step. I'm not going to make a decision about my future until you speak to me, until you download your step-by-step directions. I'm not going to go forward. But you know what I've learned as I've grown older and begun to mature in my relationship with Jesus? Is that there's actually a lot more latitude in God's will than I used to give him credit for. Right? Like now I find myself of a new school of thought. A school of thought that says, God, I don't expect you to speak to me until I start taking steps, until I move. But again, for years I was stuck in this first mentality. God, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to make a decision. I'm not going to move forward in the things that you have for me until you speak to me, until you download step by step directions. Uh, I was what I like to call a GPS Christian. Are, are you a GPS Christian? You know, that, that thing where we want God to be our, our Google Maps guru for us, right? Download step by step. This is what you do year one. This is what you do year two. Right? Do you use GPS now? I use it all the time. When I get in my car, I use GPS every time I get in my car. I use the Waze app. Do you know the Waze app? Waze app is awesome because it's smart, right? You, you put in your destination, and not only does it spit out for you step by step directions, but it tells you how fast you're going. It, it sees obstructions ahead and it reroutes you if necessary. It's even got an ETA, right? Like you will arrive at this exact moment. Did you know you could change the voice that speaks to you? This is new to me. There's like a list of 15 voices, and I chose Kate because she's British, and when she speaks to me, I feel like James Bond, right? Like, it's pretty awesome. But if I'm, off, if I, if I'm awesome, if, I, if I'm honest, it is what it is, guys. Let's just get on board with that. Uh, if, I, if I'm honest, for years, I wanted God to be like the Waze app for me. I wanted God to speak to me like Kate speaks to me, right? Like, turn left here, and in three years, I want you to apply for this job. And then in two years, I want you to start dating this person. Wait, hold on. Obstruction ahead. Obstruction ahead. Reroute. Reroute. Avoid that person. Right? And I so desperately wanted to be in God's perfect will. I wanted him to give me a map because it's easier that way. Right? It's safer that way. There's security in knowing ahead of time. But you know what I've discovered about God? is that when it comes to his will, God's not really into maps. Like God doesn't do maps. And I actually think that's biblical. I had you find Genesis chapter 12 in your Bible. And I want to begin reading in verse number one. And just to set the context, this is when God appears to Abram, who we later come to know as Abraham. But this is their first moment. This is their first encounter. And listen to what God says to Abram. Verse one, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. If you got a pen, maybe highlight that, that last phrase, that I will show you. Verse 2, he gives him a promise. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great, and I'll bless those that bless you. I'll curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot, who was his nephew, went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So God turns up to this man named Abram who would become Abraham and says, hey, get up, go, start moving, start walking. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose for your life. I've got a destination that I want to take you to, but here's the catch. I'm not going to tell you where that destination is. Hebrews chapter 11, I had you find that place. It speaks to this very thing. Look at verse number eight, Hebrews 11 and eight. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going not knowing where he was going. In other words, God's saying, look, as you go, I'm going to show you. God says to Abraham, look, I'm not going to give you a map. And if you're going to follow me, it's going to require you to give me a few things. It's going to require you to live a life of flexibility. It's going to require you to live a life of faith. It's going to require flexibility. Think about Abraham. He's 75 years old when God shows up to him. 75. You want to talk about somebody stuck in their ways? You want to talk to somebody that's already got a set trajectory, set course for their life? And listen, if you find yourself in here this morning or watching online, you're part of the Abraham generation. You just need to know this. God's not done with you. And we still need to live flexible lives. As a matter of fact, whether you're Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob generation, we need to live lives that are flexible. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, the same thing that applied to Abraham applies to us. We need to be flexible and full of faith. Flexible. We need to hold our plans and our timetables and our purposes with an open hand because we're playing a big game of follow the leader. And guess what? You ain't the leader. We need to be flexible. 
and moldable in the hand of the potter. We need to, to follow with faith. Hebrews 11, we read it. By faith, Abraham went out, not knowing where he was going. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. It takes faith to follow Jesus. It takes faith to believe that his hand of love is upon us and is guiding our life, that he wants to take us from strength to strength and from glory to glory. God is a good God, and it takes faith to follow him when you don't know where you're going. It takes faith to follow God when he doesn't give you a map. And here's a stark reality for us. If God didn't give Abraham a map, chances are he's not going to give you a map either because God's not into maps. But he's given us something else, and I want to call it a compass. God has hardwired each and every human heart with a compass, and that compass comes in the form of our leanings and our desires. It comes in the form of our, our gifts and our talents. It comes in the form of, of our strengths and our weaknesses. It comes in the, the form of our natural bents and proclivities and, and propensities. It, it comes in, in the form of the things that we like and the things that we don't like. It comes in the form of the things that make us happy and the things that make us angry. All of those things are, 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 are needles, their hands on the compass, their signposts that point us to the reason we were put here on this sphere of a planet. As I look back at my life, it's of no surprise to me that I ended up being a preacher. Um, I guess it's kind of always in, been in me that this compass was just sort of pointing me towards it. I, I've always, for as long as I can remember, I, I've had this desire to be in front of people. But for a time, my, my compass was pointing in a slightly different direction. I, I had this, this idea, this illusion of grandeur that I was going to be a rock star during the week and I was going to be a worship leader on the weekend. So I decided to get myself a guitar, get some guitar lessons, right? Three lessons in, I realized I've got zero aptitude for music. And did you know that when you try and play guitar and you put your fingers on the string, it hurts your fingers, right? Like, Ain't nobody got time for that. And on top of it, then I go, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and learn how to sing. So I start recording my voice. And I won't say that I'm tone deaf, but I really have a hard time staying in range here. And so I go, okay, forget that. Forget that. I'm going to be a songwriter. That's difficult too. You see, my desire was there, but my gifting was elsewhere. And if you want to discover God's will for your life, it's a smart place to start is where your desire and your gifting meet. Right? Desire and you're gifting me. So I had this desire to be in front of people, but my gifting was pointing me in a slightly different direction. I said, okay, well, what am I good at? Well, I like to talk. I like to have my voice heard, and I feel like I can encourage people, that I can exhort people. I, I love the scriptures. I feel like I can sort of break them down and, and simplify them. So where do I have an avenue to express this gift? I go, okay, our youth ministry, cool. So at 18, 19 years old, I start serving in the youth ministry, and it started with just standing at the door, greeting young people as they walk through the door. And then I started being a small group leader. Then I got into mentoring, and I, I, I take kids to coffee and we'd share the scriptures together. And then eventually they let me preach at youth. And man, I was so excited, but the message was horrible, but I had fun. And then like a year later, they asked me to do my second message and, and then my third. And next thing I know, I'm a youth pastor. And then I did that for nine years. And then for the last four years, I've been leading the church. And now this morning, I'm standing here before you and I look at it all and I go, wow, God, you're amazing. But people always ask me like, Harrison, well, did God like turn up in your bedroom with all the angels and declare to you out loud? I want you to be a preacher. No, he didn't. Like, that would have been awesome. Would have been a lot easier. But I just, just sort of pointed my life in the general direction of my, my desires and, and my gifts. And when my desire and my gift got in alignment, I found myself here in this place. And like I said, as I look back at my life, it's of no surprise to me I ended up being a preacher. I guess it's, it's sort of always been in me. Uh, I have evidence if you don't believe me, and I brought it with me. Would you, would you like to see that evidence? Can we throw that first picture up on the screen? Um, that's me. I'm at about four and a half, five years old. And, and what you can see there is I am leading the service for my brother and my sister. And I've got my, my pulpit, right? Like my, my box of pampers. I got the Bible open. And I've got a guitar in my hand, right? So not only am I the worship leader, I'm also the, the preacher. And then you'll notice Ernie in the background there on the bed. And if you see him in heaven, you know it was this moment that he came into the kingdom, right? <laughs> Um, we got more. Um, can you throw the next one up? That's me uh, witnessing to Gumby, right? I've got the Bible open. We're going through Pauline doctrine. It, it's, it is what it is, guys. And uh, that's me at about three and a half years old. And then we got, we got one more, unfortunately. Uh, that's me standing there preaching from a box of Pampers. Got the Bible open. And what you can't see, my parents are in the background. They're sitting there listening to me preach. And I've got my stuffed animals all lined up. Just an important moment. But like I said, that desire was always there. And you know why God puts desires in your heart? so that he can give you the desires of your heart. And if you'll just point your life in the general direction 
of your leanings and your desires and your gifts, you'll be living a God-led life, sometimes not even knowing it. I know some people, they struggle with the simplicity of that, but I really don't think it's any more complicated. Point your life in the general direction of your compass and watch God begin to lead you. We've got to move. We've got to take steps. As we go, God begins to lead. God begins to show us. Some of us, perhaps in here, we've had this desire. We, we love to write. You know, it's, it's wired up in us. And from the time we were really small, we've just devoured books and different styles of writing. And, and, and we journal and we fill up multiple journals and we go on social media and we read people's posts and, and their bad grammar drives us nuts because people don't know the difference between T-O and T-O-O or Y-O-U-R and Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. And, and maybe that's a signpost as to why you were put here on the planet. Maybe you should point your desire and your gifting in that direction and see what God might do. Maybe you should start writing an online blog. Maybe you should write articles and submit them to local magazines and newspapers and see if God might open a door for you. Maybe you've got this natural propensity for leadership. You don't know how it happens or why it happens, but you walk into a room and the room lights up. You're sort of the Pied Piper. Everybody kind of falls in line behind you and you've got this ability to encourage people and you love to, to teach the scriptures. Man, do something with that. Join the, join the leadership college. Maybe join the outreach or go on a mission trip. Do something and see what God might do. See what doors God might open. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 18 that a man's gift makes room for him and puts him before great men. But we've got to give God something to work with. And as we go, he'll show us. Now, let's say we begin to step this thing out and we begin to walk in the call of God. We begin to point our life in the direction of that compass. And let's say God starts opening doors, which by the way, he will do. What do you do when God opens multiple doors? What do you do when you've got multiple options in front of you that seem like good options? What do you do then? And it's important to know because if we're not careful, when multiple options open themselves before us, we can get back up on the balance beam and go, oh God, which one is it? And I don't want to get this wrong. And could it be door one or is it door two? Listen. If you find yourself in that place where you have multiple options, can I just give you some advice? Always remember this, that the favor of God and the call of God, the blessing of God, it's on you and not on the choice. It's on you. It's not on door one. It's not on door two. It's on you. And again, this is biblical. We find this one chapter later with the story of Abraham, Genesis chapter 13. He's gone out from the place where God called him to go. He's with Lot and God has blessed them. God has prospered them and their group has become so large they can't travel together anymore. So you see Abraham take Lot up on a hill. It's sort of this Mufasa Simba moment where Abraham goes, look out and everywhere the light touches, that belongs to us. And Lot, you know, you choose right, then I'm going to go left. And if you go left, then I'm going to go right. Lot, but you choose which parcel of land that you want. And Lot chooses, of course, the best parcel of land. And you step back from the scripture and you go, Abraham, you're the patriarch of this family. And God came and spoke to you. And Lot's just kind of tagging along for the ride. Why are you giving him preferential choice here? Because Abraham understood something. That wherever he went, God's favor was on him and not on the destination. Abraham understood that he had a promise that wherever he went, God would be with him and God would bless those that bless him. God would curse those that curse him. And through Abraham, all the families of the earth would be blessed. And friend, that same promise is on you. God's favor, it's on you. And as we begin to follow God, as we begin to pursue his will for our lives, at some point we will come to that proverbial fork in the road where we have these choices before us. Maybe it has to do with a job and we've been at this job for a long time and we make good money and then we get offered a promotion. We're thinking, this is great, but then another opportunity for a job comes and maybe it's a little bit of a, a lower starting point, but there's so much more room for growth and potential. You can grow with the company, the salary might grow and you're like, God, what are you saying to me? Where am I supposed to go? I don't know what to do with these two options. If you're faced with multiple options, can I, can I give us maybe three thoughts, three tests uh, to kind of run us through to help us identify what God's will might be? Here's the first one. We just call it the prayer test. We ask ourselves a question, have I prayed about this? It's amazing how quick we, we kind of go headlong into stuff without consulting God. And the truth is God wants to speak to you. God's always speaking. Sometimes we have the problem with hearing. Have I prayed about this? The, the second test that we can run through is this. Let's call it the wisdom test. And there's three parts to this, three, three questions under the wisdom test. The first is this. Uh, do these options or does one of these options, uh, is it in alignment with God's word? Because God's word is his will. And by the way, God's word is our final authority on all things pertaining to life and godliness. 
So is this option in alignment with God's word? Someone goes, Harrison, well, does God really care where I live? Not, not really, but God speaks in his word a lot about stewardship. So he cares whether or not you can afford the house that you're about to move into. Does God really care about who I date? Well, God cares about you and God cares about that other person. And his word speaks a lot to not being yoked up with unbelievers. So God does care in that sense. And as we look at this option, does it align itself with God's word? Because if it doesn't, it doesn't pass the wisdom test. The second question under the wisdom test is this. Um, when I look at these options, is there a noticeable lack of peace? Did you know that's one of the most common ways that God guides his people is through peace? Through that still small voice on the inside. And as I start pursuing one of these options, is there a noticeable lack of peace? The Bible says all of wisdom's pathways are peace. And, and then the last question under the wisdom test is this. Do these options or does one of these options, does it fit my values? Let's say I value my home life, but I've got this option to take this new job and it seems like a great thing, but it's going to add 10 hours to my work week. So that means I'm going to leave in the morning before my kids are awake. I'm not going to ever get to take them to school. And when I get home, they're already going to be in bed. Well, it's a great job. It's great money, but does it fit my values? If it doesn't, it's not in alignment with God's word. If, if it doesn't, then it doesn't pass the wisdom test. And then the third and final test, this is the easiest, the most practical of them all. It's my favorite. Uh, does it pass the joy test? As you look at the options, you just ask yourself the question, will I feel fulfilled in this? If I take this option, will I feel fulfilled? And the second question is this, as I look at my two options, is there one that I prefer over the other? Now, what do you do if you have run through the list and you've done your checklist, but one option doesn't present itself as the clear winner? What do I do then? What does God want me to do then? I can tell you what God wants you to do. God wants you to choose. Because remember, there's more latitude in his will than we give him credit for because God's favor is on us and not on door one and not on door two. And at the end of the day, please never forget this. God is sovereign. He has a sovereign plan. He has a sovereign will. And not you, not me, no decision we can make can thwart his plan in the earth. And I just believe that God's big enough that if I do stuff out of a right heart, a heart that says, God, I want to honor you and I want to help people, even if I make the wrong choice, God is able to pick me up and put me where I need to be. God is sovereign. And I think sometimes he's going, look, you just choose as you go. I'll show you. Remember, I don't expect God to speak to me until I start taking steps. 13 years ago, before my wife and I got married, we, uh, we had the opportunity to move here to Australia, to the city of Brisbane. We were offered a job and, uh, we were excited about the opportunity. We prayed it through and, you know, we did the wisdom test and the joy test and we didn't, we didn't feel like there was a clear option of a clear guidance from God. And so uh, we submitted it before leadership and they said, you know, you know, why don't you just stay for six months, stay for six months, take on the youth ministry, get it to a healthy place. And when that's done, we can readdress this. And if you guys want to go, then, then you can go. So we stayed six months. And when that came up, we prayed about it again and ran it through the checklist, wisdom and joy, and didn't feel like there was a clear winner. And so submitted it again before leadership. And they said, look, if you want to go, you could go. So my wife and I said, you know what? Well, we don't expect God to speak to us until we start taking steps, until we make a decision. We felt like God was saying, look, why don't you, why don't you just choose? And we're like, yeah, God's favor is on us and, and not on Australia and not on America. Like we're going to choose. And we decided, Hey, we're going to have an adventure. We're going to move to Brisbane. So we call up the guy and Hey, is that job still available? What's going on with all that? And he goes, well, you know, we, we told you to take your time. We knew you were going to take this six months, but we really had to fill the position. So we, unfortunately we filled it and that's not available to you anymore. And at first we were a little bit deflated, but, but then I began to read the scripture and I realized that God doesn't just lead his people through open doors, but he also leads people through closed doors. As a matter of fact, I think that's the most common way that God leads his people. And that's scriptural. You, you look at Acts 16, Paul, the apostle Paul is on mission. He's taking the gospel around the globe. The Bible says this, he tries to go to Asia minor but the Holy Spirit forbid him. The Holy Spirit said, no, the Holy Spirit closed the door. Can I tell you what you don't see Paul do? Paul doesn't sit there and begin to pout and begin to whine and go, God, well, where did I miss you in all of this? And I thought I was doing your will and God, I'm not going to move and I'm not going to take a step. I'm not going to go anywhere else until you tell me exactly where I need to go. No, he doesn't do that. Paul goes, okay, I can't go there. I'm going to go to Mycenae. And he starts going to Mycenae, but then the door shuts in front of him. Hmm. He doesn't stop. Oh God, I'm not going to move until you speak. No, he just, he just keeps moving. I can't go to my city. Cool. I'm going to go to Bithynia. But the Holy Spirit says no. And the door gets shut. Cool. I'm going to go to Troas. So he starts going to Troas. The door gets shut. All of a sudden, Paul has a dream. He has a vision. Come to Macedonia. And that's where the Philippian church was started. I'm telling you, the most common way that God will guide you and me is through the doors that he shuts rather than the doors that he opens. 
And my wife and I, we've walked this out, and God has shut some doors for us, and we know, and he, beyond any shadow of a doubt, we're in the middle of his will for our life because we know that the steps of a godly man or woman, the steps to forward motion, are ordered to the Lord. And even if we stumble, even if we make the right choice out of the wrong heart, he upholds us by his hand. The Bible says man makes his plans, but it's the Lord that directs his steps, plural steps, forward motion, forward momentum. But isn't it good to know that God's everlasting arms are beneath us, that no matter where we go and what we do, he upholds us. Listen, if you're sitting here this morning, as we begin to wrap this up, if you are struggling with this idea of discovering God's will for your life specifically, I've got a word for you. I can help you. I can tell you what God's will is for your life in two words. You ready? Do something. That's God's will for your life, that you would do something that you would point your life in the general direction of your compass, those leanings and those desires. Step out in faith. Step out with a flexible heart, a heart that says, God, I want to honor you. I want to help people. I want to leave a lasting mark on the pages of eternity. God, I want my life to count. If you do that, if you have an honest and a sincere heart before him, watch him begin to lead you. Watch him begin to open doors. Watch him begin to close doors. And remember, his favor's on you and not on a destination. Before we pray together, let me just leave you with an illustration, a story to think about. My friend and I, in our early 20s, we spent a good part of the year going to different uh, musical venues and watching different bands perform. It's one of the things I've always loved. I've always been drawn to music. And uh, one moment stands out in particular to me. My friend and I were going to go to a show down in San Diego. Now, we live just south of LA in San Diego. For those that aren't familiar, it's about two hours south of LA. And uh, it's right off the freeway. And we, we were there at my friend's house getting ready to go. And we were going to meet another friend that was already down at the venue ahead of us. And we're sitting in the driveway at my friend's home. And I'm like, come on, man, let's go. He's like, oh, we got to wait. We got to wait. Our friend's going to text us with the directions on how to get there. So we waited five minutes and 10 minutes. We're listening to music. We're getting so excited about this show. And after about 10 minutes, I was getting frustrated. I'm like, man, let's, let's just go. He's like, no, we got to wait for directions. Otherwise, we won't know where we're going. I'm like, man, San Diego, it's, it's a big city and it's south. Like, let's just go. How much direction do we need to get started? Like, let's just point the car south and get going. And as we get going, we'll receive that clear, you know, specific direction as to where we need to end up. It reminds me of a lot of people, people that love God, people that want to serve God, people that want to be in his will for their life, but they're there in the driveway of their life, stuck in the car of their life, waiting for direction. Listen, if that's you, can I just say, point your life, the car of your life, in the direction of God's heart, point it in the direction of your giftings, your leanings, and your desires, and get moving. Get moving. And as you go, he'll show you. Come on, let's pray together. God, we love you. Thank you so much that you've not left us alone to figure this out on our own, but you've given us your word. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us a, an amazing community of believers, Father, to help us to continually push us forward into the call of God on our life. Father, for those of us in here that have struggled with what it is you want us to do, Father, I thank you for clarity and I thank you for courage. Courage to take this message and apply it, that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but doers. Father, may we have hearts that are flexible before you, where we hold our plans and our dreams and our timetables with an open hand, and we say, God, wherever you lead, we're going to go. May we have faith, Father, that says, even though this is scary, even though I don't know where I'm going to end up, I'm trusting that your hand of love is upon me that you're leading, you're guiding, that your plans for me are good, to prosper me, to give me a future and a hope. Father, help us as the church to help each other move forward in the things that you've placed upon our lives. With your head still bowed and your eyes still closed, I want to take two minutes and I want to give you an invitation, an invitation to know God. This morning, we've talked a lot about God's will for our lives. You know where God's will starts? The Bible says this very clearly, that God's will is that none should perish but that all would experience the amazing grace and love of, Father, of the Father, that all would experience eternal life. And friend, that's something we all need. We all need eternity. We all need eternal life. We all need grace. We all need the love of the Father. We need grace. We need love because sin has entered our world. As a matter of fact, we were born into a state of sin. Sin is a systemic human problem. In other words, you can trace it back to the beginning, back to the garden, that fateful moment where Adam and Eve decided to step out from underneath the authority of God. They wanted to decide what was right and what was wrong in their life. The Bible says in that moment, sin entered the world and death through sin. And now each and every one of us, you and I, we were born 
into this state of separation, the state of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin, the consequences of sin are death. That's a steep price to pay. That's a punishment that costs it all. But God in his amazing love, that while we were still in sin, he made a way and he sent his son Jesus. And Jesus lived the life that you and I could not live. He lived a perfect, sinless life. But yet he took the penalty for our sin. Not only did he take the penalty for our sin, he became our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. I wonder, have you experienced that righteousness of God? Have you experienced the love of God that is so supernatural and so magnanimous in nature? The love of God that loves you right now in your space, loves you just as you are, but the love of God that never leaves you as you are. The love of God that the moment you accept it goes to work in your heart, changing you, molding you, transforming you into the image of Jesus. Friend, that's what eternal life is. It's to know the Father and to know the one he sent. Eternal life is not just this ambient term that's going to come one day where we step into heaven. Yeah, that's part of it. But eternal life happens right now. Eternity breaks into your world and it changes you from the inside out where you literally become more and more like Jesus as you allow him to love you more than you love him. That's eternal life, being a follower and a disciple of Jesus. And if you're not in relationship with him, if you are troubled about the state of your soul this morning, I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to introduce you to my Savior, to my Jesus. Listen, I'm not going to take any more time because I trust the Holy Spirit's been at work convicting hearts and convincing hearts, convicting hearts of sin and yet convincing hearts that there's a Savior that's greater than any amount of sin, that if you put your trust in him, you can find salvation, you can find forgiveness, you can find peace and hope that your heart has been longing for. So this morning, with nobody looking around but me, I'm going to just ask, when I count to three, if you want in on this prayer, if you want to meet Jesus, if you want to make him the Lord and the Savior of your life, either for the first time or perhaps today, you've come to this realization that you're a prodigal, that you're out and about, and you need to come home, I'd love to pray with you. When I get to three, if that's you and you want in on this prayer, if you're troubled about the state of your soul, would you lift a hand so I know who I'm praying for this morning? Here we go. Not any more time. One, two. Three, all across this place. If that's you today, you want to make Jesus Lord. Go ahead and just slip that hand up. I see that hand. Somebody's standing. I see you, sir. Well done. God bless you. Even up the back, I see you. More importantly, God sees you. Hands up in most sections. You can go ahead and put them down. We're going to pray, and I'm going to give us some words. And I wonder if maybe as a family, we could say them together to help those that are going to pray this for the first time. Listen, I'm going to give you words, but these words inherently are not magical. They're not mystical. But the moment you tie sincerity of heart and the moment you tie faith to these words, that's when God meets you. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, that's when the supernatural happens. That's when salvation takes place. That's when eternity breaks in. So come on, let's pray together. Would you repeat this with me? Say, Jesus, I need you. I realize I can't do this life on my own. I realize it's been revealed to me that sin has separated me from you. And that you are my savior and that you love me and you gave yourself for me and you took the penalty for my sin. So I trust you and I call you Lord and I call you savior and I ask you to lead and guide me as you see fit. It's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Come on. Can we give a round of applause to those that responded to Jesus this morning? Church, that's what it's all about. People coming to know the Savior. Hey, thank you for having me. I love you guys. What an amazing church you are. Pastor Sam, why don't you come?